quick disclaimer, this is an all new game from Nintendo. There's gonna be no tutorial on what you're seeing here. And this title is available for purchase now. Highly recommend it. Thank you so much and enjoy the show. Hey, welcome to a very special episode of an ongoing series where we basically take the camera anywhere we want to try to find secrets and new discoveries to some of our favorite games. And I am over the moon right now. I cannot believe that I can look at Super Mario RPG out of bounds in a fully 3D environment. This game is immaculately recreated to be almost just like the original, just with some spruced up visuals. And so it's like a dream come true. I never thought that this could be possible. And the only reason why it is possible today is because of the cam's creator, Hebo. It takes a considerable amount of mathematical knowledge as well as other skills in order to make a camera like this. So thank you so much, Hebo. There's gonna be links to his YouTube channel down below. And also thank you so much to Dan Flynn for making that animated intro so many years ago for the original Super Mario RPG Boundary Break episode. Anyways, I've unintentionally stalled you long enough. Let us check out some of the many, many cool things that were found for this episode. This is the first episode I ever made where I had the hardest time trying to curate what I wanted to show you guys first, because my go-to plan for this show is always to show you the best things first. But with Super Mario RPG, the most exciting thing for this show because of the forced perspective that this game and its predecessor has always had throughout the years. So we've started out by showing you a different perspective of the world map. There's a giant square of water that surrounds the map that goes well outside of the player's perspective. I also want to take the camera close up to certain towns and areas because, again, the camera is pulled so far back that you don't get a great look at this texture work. It's also really surprising to see that the entire world map is modeled almost on all sides. If you take the camera behind it, generally speaking, it looks just about as good as it would from the front. You can also see some really cool things here like this tentacle that's identical to the boss's tentacle later in the game, which has a funny rendering at the end that is usually not seen by the player. But most peculiar of all, there seems to be a render of a chasm that's completely unused. Well, not completely unused. It seems to be the exact same model as the chasm used for Monstro Town. But why there's another one underneath the ground, I have no idea. Because even though I haven't even visited Monstro Town yet, you can see with the camera here that that model is still there. And next up we have Mario's house. Now I know that we looked at it earlier with the intro of the show, but taking the camera out, it's fantastic. It has an upside down sky dome that shows a whole bunch of forest underneath the cliff sides of this area. I have to say, I love what the developers did to flesh out these environments. It's so much better than the world just suddenly stopping like in the original game. Also, Mario's house is not fully textured on all sides, but it is modeled on all sides. And of course, while I'm just talking here, I'm really happy to be able to show you all these different angles for this environment. And next up, we're going to be doing a viewer request. As always, you can follow me on Discord if you ever want to give me a viewer request. But the big popular one this time around was about the NPC that can never be seen by the player behind this building. In the original game, there was no sprite to represent this NPC. But in the remake, you can see it's the toad villager with blonde hair and a green vest. And of course, in the remake, there's also another hidden NPC that can fill out your bestiary log. Take the camera around and show you that he's also a blonde NPC toad with a green vest. And then in Rose Town, there's an NPC behind this building here that's frozen in this point in time, but then walks around town once you defeat Bowyer. And he is a blonde NPC toad with a green vest, standing against a poorly textured backside of a building, by the way. But not only that, there's also one more NPC that's hidden behind this building at all times that gives you advice about the Goomba Stomping minigame. And he is a blonde NPC toad with a green vest. But this video isn't gonna be all about blonde NPC toads with green vests. What you're seeing here is a zoom out of Mary Moore, which again, can't we all just agree that the zoom outs in this game look fantastic? I thought for sure there was gonna be culling, but surprisingly, no, there's like no culling in this game. But that's not why I'm showing you this scene. For some reason in Mary Moore's cathedral, there's an unused entrance to the building that might've been originally intended for extra content that was cut by the team. You cannot walk back here. I've tried in different ways, jumping, walking, whatever, but completely unseen by the player is this unique archway that clearly looks like a secret entrance, which is funny because on the opposite side, there is a secret entrance that's supposed to be used in the game, but there's no modeling used for that. Instead, if you're confused and you think that you see it, it's actually just a giant gape that shows you the front door entrance instead. 
And here at Tadpole Pond, there's an unused sky texture. The camera never ever points up. This might have been used at one point to have dynamic angling for Frog Fuchsius or Frog Sage in this version, but that never happens and the camera is committed to pointing downward like in the original game. So what we might be left with in this case is another scrapped idea left behind by the team. And again, speaking of scrapped ideas left behind by the team, they went above and beyond for the wrecked ship in this remake, showing way more of the ship than in the original game. However, in the original game, the wind sails were in great shape. Whereas in the remake, there's only one sail and it's completely tattered. However, underneath the environment seems to be leftovers of some kind, indicating that at one point there were supposed to be sails that were fully intact and used. Whether this was meant to be extra content or a visual style that was changed and just shoved underneath the ground to prevent crashing, we'll never know. And now that we've covered that segment of the show, let's do a zoom out of the Mushroom Kingdom. And how about a zoom in too? Next up, we're gonna be talking about character models and they're amazing. I'm so glad that I can talk about someone like Boshi, a fan favorite character, of course, who managed to go completely unscathed. I guess he's completely owned by Square Enix, I'm guessing, since he's not homogenized like the rest of the Yoshis on Yoshi's Island. Point is though, is that if you remove his glasses, he has the lazy eye look that was present in the Super Nintendo era of the Mario universe. You can see this in game as well. It's just a little bit harder. And if we take the character into a model viewer, we can remove the glasses outright to show you essentially what that would look like. The only difference I found here was that for whatever reason, the eye color in the actual game is a dark blue, whereas in this model viewer, it appears to be black, but that might be due to the lighting of each character in their respective spaces. Next up is Link, of course. Link comes back in the Super Mario RPG remake as a cameo, and his model has more than what meets the eye. Taking the camera underneath his bed sheets can show you that everything from the chest up is fully modeled, which again, most of this is covered up by blankets, so it's surprising to see this much of the character model here. Taking it into a model viewer gives you a nice clean look of what this character model looks like, and yes, I am thinking exactly what you are thinking. This model looks awesome, amazing to have it in a modern Zelda game, and sadly, Nintendo seems to think that we've all moved on from it, and we, we would love to see Classic Link come back. But good on the developers of Super Mario RPG for not modernizing this model and staying true to what it looked like back in 1996. Speaking of models that are true to their 1996 original, here we got Samus. Same idea. There's some arms as well as a chest plate that you can't see as the player, and all of it is based off of the Super Metroid model, which was released at the time in 1996. Next, we got the Beatlemania Toad. I could have sworn he had a name, but doing my research on Google, I couldn't find anything, which is weird. Point is though, this character has sunglasses on and I was curious to see if he had eyes underneath his sunglasses and the answer is yes. I was also a bit surprised to see that he has a smile on his face because he's such a rude character, but it is very apparent at this point that it is just a regular Toad model that has a color swap as well as some sunglasses added to the model. Another thing that was added to this model was its Game Boy or its copy of Beatlemania. And taking a look at this up close can show you that there's a cartridge with no label, of course, but on the opposite side, there's a GameCube-like analog stick with Super Famicom buttons. Also a Game Boy screen with no game being displayed. You little faker. Also, you can see that there's a Game Boy power switch on the top of the device. And now we're going to get into the weird and bizarre. This isn't the first time we've seen this on Boundary Break, but it is very rare. And it is really, really surprising how many character models use this. Taking the camera inside of Mario's head, we'll show you all the different frames of animation for his eyelids. That's right, every part of Mario's animation is stored inside of his own head, and when it's ready to be used, it's called into the front of his face. The same can be said for his hair as well. If you look underneath his cap, it's shrunk down, but the entire model of Mario's hair is underneath his hat which means we have to now go on to the other characters and see what's going on with them. Now it has his happy eyes as well as three different types of teeth for his front tooth, which I gotta admit caught me a little bit off guard. I thought they would just use the one tooth, but uh, no, three. And when you angle it just right, Mal looks fabulous. I can't even think of a single better word to describe it. As for the opposite of fabulous, how about we go over to Princess Peach and when she's crying, obviously her eyes are closed the entire time, which means that if you take the camera inside of her head model at this time, you could see the open eyeballs inside of her head, which 
There you go. Good luck sleeping tonight. And now that I think about it, thanks to the original Super Mario RPG episode that I did, this is the second time that Princess Peach has been involved in some sort of weird amalgamation of horror-themed creepypasta that is absolutely nightmare-inducing. Also, before we move on to that, here's a good look at Princess Peach with her eyes open, and you can see the exact moment in which she blinks and how it affects the eyelids inside of her head. And something that's a bit weird here, there's an expression that Gino is supposed to have in this scene where I believe his eyes are supposed to be closed, looking kind of happy in a way. But because the camera's always turned when he does this pose, you could see that the eyelid line is just overlaid on an open eyeball, making for a model error. Also, seeing Gino laugh from a different angle is kind of interesting. I believe there's supposed to be some forced perspective going on here to make it look nicer, but looking at it from the front, everything is sort of shifted in weird directions to make it look nicer from the isometric angle. As for Bowser, he's kind of got the same idea going on. It's just a bit weirder. Taking the camera inside of his head when he's doing this very angry pose can show you that his irises are just underneath that layer, as well as his eyelids. And yes, there's teeny, teeny, tiny, shrunken down versions of the tears that you famously see when you see Bowser throughout the story. However, the toy version of Bowser, which never changes expression for whatever reason, has his eyelids and crying eyes inside the model at full size. The same cannot be said for Princess Peach, who has none of her eyelids stored inside of her body, which just adds to the insanity. And then now we're gonna move on to enemy models that have the same idea. This character model never blinks. However, inside the character model is some unused blinking animation that would have been used if the character blinked. Goombas also happen to store a happy emotion as well as a wincing emotion. And then this enemy here uses little babies you might remember. And then taking the camera in here can show you where they're all stored, which is in one spot. Then you can see that the spinies have their own spiny balls stored inside of them. And then shrinks down what's hiding inside to a super tiny degree. Now, as for Johnny or Jonathan Jones, I knew that he had a yellow thing inside of his mouth, but I just couldn't figure out what the heck it was. And I thought it was like a gold tooth or something. I could never figure it out, even with the official renders. And so Super Mario RPG Remake finally answers this question for me, and I'll give you a much better look of it now. The yellow thing inside of Jonathan Jones's mouth is the body of Jonathan Jones. It's its eye. So in truth, Jonathan Jones defeated the shark and wore its body. And in truth, you're fighting some evil looking looking figure that is hiding inside of this body. Wild stuff. Anyways, while we're in Jonathan Jones's room, there's two things I want to show you. One is that this map is clearly a map to Yoster Island, an island that you can go to in the game of Super Mario RPG. It's much harder to notice this from the player perspective, but if you move the camera all the way up to the map like this, you can see the racetracks that are clearly drawn on the map. And also the outline of the island is identical to that of Yoster's Island. And then on Jonathan Jones's table is another map with an island that almost looks like Delfino, but it's not quite the same geographically. Also, I just wanted to show you a couple of enemy models from different angles. Once again, enemy models just can only be seen from an isometric angle in the original game. So being able to twirl the camera around certain enemies is a big treat for someone like me, and I imagine it'll be a big treat for someone like you too. Here's a nice close-up of Boyer for a little bit here, but more important than anything else in the whole world, we can finally take the camera close up to the birds. Fans of Boundary Break know that birds oftentimes in video games don't get the love and attention that they deserve. And in the case of Super Mario RPG, they're pretty high poly modeled. They got a white belly along with a brown top and dark brown eyes. And there's not a lot of birds in Super Mario RPG, but there is one more tiny creature that I think a lot of fans might recognize. It's the beetle. The beetle is so tiny in Super Mario RPG that you would never be able to see all these details up close. Another cool thing about this model here is that it stores its wings inside of its body at all times. So we can get a good look at what those wings look like when they're not in motion. Also, when it's flying, you can see that there's a unique texture for the top of its body as well. We may have spent too much time looking at a beetle of all things. So why don't we look at some Nintendo references instead? At the top of Booster's Tower, there's a toy box with various objects inside. And now it's abundantly clear if it wasn't before, what each of these toys were supposed to be. The first one we're looking at is Samus, and it appears to be the Varius suit from Metroid Other M. The model is nearly fully modeled except for one thing, the feet, which I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I'm really surprised that the model goes that deep anyways. I thought for sure it would stop at least the thighs or something like that. Moving on, we got Rob the Robot, and this version is based off of the Famicom design due to its white body and red arms. And then this guy's name is wasting 20 minutes of my time trying to research the name of it, because it 
doesn't exist. So your first thought might be, oh, this is a stunt race effects character. And I think that's what they were going for here, but there's not a single vehicle in stunt race effects that uses a convertible car. The closest is the F-Type, how it managed to end up being a convertible is something I'm not so sure about. And then the last one is Discoon. Come on, we all know Discoon, right? Okay, maybe not everybody knows who Discoon is, but he was the mascot character for the proprietary discs for the Famicom disc system that was only in Japan. Any ports we had of Famicom disc games over here in the US were converted to carts. Definitely check out my Zelda 1 Region Break episode if you wanna learn a little bit more about that. But that's actually not the last cameo that you can find in Booster's Tower. I think I could speak for at least a good portion of us at least that none of us really understood that this was Magitek armor being displayed on the front desk, which I mean is really cool. I love me some Final Fantasy VI, but I just never would have guessed that. Anyways, this Magitek armor is based off of the sprite version, not the conceptual art, which is really, really cool. I like that it's modeled on all sides too. And just for the heck of it, we're gonna look at all the portraits for Booster's ancestors. Starting from the left, we got French Dr. Robotnik, Wario, a pirate, Foreman Spike, Sam Hyde, and a nutmeg salesman. And then this one's pretty awesome. In this very rare scene that I'm glad they kept in the game, Mario has to be held back from Mallow after Gaz kind of throws some shade at him. And since the camera is pointed at his back, you don't get to see what his facial expression looks like. It turns out that he has angry eyebrows as well as a devilish smile. Not what I was expecting. I was honestly expecting a muted expression since, you know, you never get to see the front of his face. But no, there's a devilishness to his expression that happens, I think, only in this scene. Here's some more enemy models up close, like Gorilla here, as well as these other two enemies. But what's really interesting is that throw for here looks great up close, of course. But when you take the camera underneath the ground, you can see that his body is fully modeled. He has his own set of feet that's never seen by the player. And then there's King Calamari. If you take the camera inside of the pot that King Calamari comes from, you can see that his head is fully modeled. Also, here's a 360 spin of the cake in case there's any bakers that watch this show that is desperate to get a 360 spin so they can replicate it properly. But moving on from that, let's talk about Jinx. Jinx's character model, as well as his sprite in the original game, are so tiny that you never really get a great look at him. I think he's one of the best examples, though, of something you might have noticed up to this point, that all the clothing in this game uses textures that really bring out the vibrancy and detail of the clothing. It's really easy to miss in-game, which makes it all the more impressive that the developers went through all this trouble. And with that said, let's do a zoom out of Monstro Town, because, you know, it's just all cliffside, and it would be interesting to see what all that looks like in one shot. Moving on from there, let's just start talking about environments. In a lot of instances, you pull the camera back and there's a giant square that you wouldn't be able to see because it's blocked off by all the vegetation. Or in this case over here, a bridge. But there's a lot more lava than you would expect. In fact, the game goes through all the extra effort to have a black surface cover up any evidence of extra lava for whatever reason. But nothing's more fun than zooming out the camera here in the throne room of Bowser. Because before you even trigger the scene where you first face him, you can see here he's already standing on a chandelier with Princess Peach. And here's a little fun fact for you. At the very top of these chandeliers is a unique model that is holding the chain. It's not much, but still, it's kind of interesting that it's here. But I think we all know what we're here for. We want to see what happens when the chandeliers fall and you see Mario start just dropping through this enormously long fall. You start to notice that the drop was way, way longer than whatever it was for Mario to just jump up on the chandelier in the first place. And so what does that look like? Well, the way it's pulled off is that the background is one giant object and it travels downward and then immediately warps back into a certain position where it gives the illusion that it's just one giant environment when in fact it's not that big at all. Also if you've been paying attention while I was making that explanation you can see where Bowser's chandelier stops and how the developers move the chandeliers to make one of the last scenes play out properly. Also this is where things start to get really funky. Booster's Hill is all one environment, one giant long environment. 
I never, ever would have expected that. I thought for sure it was going to be a chunk of environment that gets reused over and over again. But nope, it's all interconnected, and you basically legitimately climb this hill. And here's one of the most absurd things I've ever seen. Most of the time, when someone walks off camera, they typically get culled out or they get deloaded. In the case of Booster and Princess Peach, though, they run into the void indefinitely. I couldn't waste my entire afternoon just seeing how far he'd go, but I waited until he got so far that the environment itself has left the bounding box of the game. And as for Mario's pad, or in this case, Mario's house, you may notice that the windows have shutters, which is interesting because clearly at one point in development, we are supposed to be able to see the outside of his property, as indicated by these white void backgrounds with tree silhouettes that you see in some other places of the game, like Princess Peach's castle. And then with Dinah and Might here, you can see them rolling on a minecart in the overworld map. But taking the camera inside the model that is Moleville will actually show you that she never gets warped or anything like that, and rather, the model just runs on a certain circular track with the only thing that's breaking this illusion is the lack of minecart tracks for the minecart to roll on. So you might notice in this scene before Bowser breaks down the door that Booster is looking at you for his little eye hole. In the original game the sprite was pulled down but kept alive in the game world. But in the remake all that happens is that the model gets pulled underneath the map and then gets called out. And the Booster Tower model is actually just a wall. Sadly not showing you the top with the balcony. But speaking of scenes that were in the original Super Nintendo Super Mario RPG Boundary Break episode, wow that was a mouthful, was showing you guys what happens when Mario goes behind the curtain to become Retro Mario. In the remake, it's way less interesting. Mario hits a certain trigger point and the Mario model disappears, gets replaced by the Pixel Mario. Though, here's an interesting fact for you. The Pixel Mario uses a billboard technique and follows the camera wherever it goes, but moving the camera directly above it causes it to not know where to go and just flips around and stuff. It's actually really funny. And then in this scene, Bowser rescues this Chain Chomp and uses it as a weapon, though he asks you to look away because the Chain Chomp is shy. Well, in this remake, I can finally show you what happens exactly while he's doing that. And the one weird thing that I will tell you is that the Chain Chomp twists to the right before disappearing, which is a little more interesting than the Chain Chomp disappearing outright with no changes whatsoever. And then in the deluxe suite for the Marymore Hotel, of course, I had to take the camera into the shower room and just see what happens. And no, I mean, like, what did you expect to happen? It's kind of interesting, though, that the model stays here. And you can see the exact second that he goes from his Italian complexion to an Irish complexion on a summer day. <laughs> no. <laughs> Moving on, I can show you the entire model for the cliffside that looks over Bowser's Keep, and also just how far away is Bowser's Keep from that cliff? It's a lot further than you think it would be. I want to believe that this is all true to scale, which means that they're at the correct distance in relation to that cliff. And then here's another little interesting fact here. The Chancellor never shows his face when he's scared, but if you take the camera over to see his face, you can see there's a unique expression that is not shown to the player. Anyways, here's the level up stage with the camera panned out. I couldn't move the camera in this scene only for some reason, but as you can see, there is a lot more going on to this environment than the game lets on. And then Midas River is exactly what I thought Booster's Hill was going to be. It loads itself in chunks as you travel through it. And we got a zoom out of Moleville, which again, looks fantastic, but Moleville also has a interesting perspective that has a sky in the background. And of course, when we pan the camera out, we can see that that sky is just one giant flat texture. Well, two giant flat textures, I should say, with one of them layered in front of the sky texture. And then we're coming back to Marymore because there's a part of the game where you can take a picture and there's this unique scene where a shutter lens closes in on the player's screen. And I just wanted to show you what that looks like from far away, which proves that there's objects that are used in a 3D plane to emulate the shutter effect. And that's all I got for Super Mario RPG Remake for now. Of course, if somehow this video gets like over a million views or something, I'll finish off the last couple chapters, but I'm sure you guys are satisfied enough with what we got here. If there's little nuggets you still want, because I know that looking at this game from different perspectives is absolutely insane, I'll throw a little compilation video that has none of my commentary on it onto my Patreon for anyone that's willing to donate a dollar to the Patreon. Patreon support is crucial right now as that YouTube ad revenue just ain't the way it used to be folks I'll tell you that so your support means everything and going forward I'm going to try to have a little bit of extra content for people that are willing to support and if you're interested in that old school Super Mario RPG episode I'll throw that on the screen as well as the Super Mario RPG region break episode that I made not that long ago that's where we look at the regional differences between the US version and the Japanese version and let me tell you Super Mario RPG has quite a few I'll, I'll just say that all right thanks so much for watching and take care